So after that little prop malfunction, Caden steps outside to the box office and we're introduced to Hazel. This short scene only lasts 20 seconds, but there is also quite a bit to pick up from it. Here we can see a poster for Bakai, which I'm not too familiar with, or even sure if I'm pronouncing it right, but given the fact that he's credited as the director on the poster, and it's the same image back in his house, I figured it was at least worth looking into to see what it was. And without spoiling anything, the Wikipedia plot summary does reference quite a bit of death. And wouldn't you know it, the play he's currently directing is Death of a Salesman. One more thing to note about Bakai is that there's a point where one of the male characters dresses up as a woman. As the film goes on, we see repeated examples of the idea that our main character's gender isn't exactly concrete. And this is something that I'll go into more detail about later. If you look closely at the book Hazel is reading, it's called Swan's Way. After looking it up, I found that it's the first volume of a novel called In Search of Lost Time. If you don't understand the relevance of that title to this film, then clearly you have not watched part one of this review, so you should go do that right away. Hey. Hey. In Search of Elusive Signal. The signal's good here, oddly. Yeah, that is odd. <laughs> yeah, cell phones, they're crazy. See in a few. Not only does this short conversation about cell phones work well for the time period, but I think that it's also hinting a little at something else. Now anyone who's watched the film would know that Caden and Hazel's relationship grows into something very special. By the end of the film, it's clear that Hazel provides the type of connection that he's been longing for. To search for a signal on your cell phone is to search for a connection. Now watch this again with that in mind. In search of elusive signal. The signal's good here. I also love how they manage to look back at each other at the same time. It's a nice subtle way to hint at what's to come of their relationship. So now Caden's outside making a phone call about seeing another doctor and we see Sammy, his stalker, once more. The next shot we see is Caden poking through his own feces. He's worrying so much about his health at this point that he starts to actively look for those problems. I think I have blood in my stool. stool in your office. Once again, he experiences miscommunication, but it's also important to note that the stool we saw didn't really have any blood in it. It would appear that Caden's obsessing so much that he's starting to see problems where there aren't any. This is an idea that applies all throughout life. Oftentimes, if you're not actively looking for something, it's not really there at all. The same could apply to part one of this review, where I went a little too far in terms of dissecting the title sequence. Turns out there's an effect in certain editing software that more or less creates what I was struggling to recreate using fake on titles. So whereas I'd still prefer to imagine that that effect was used in relevance to the themes of the film, there's a good chance that it actually wasn't, and I appreciate those who provided that helpful feedback. Oops. So now we see Caden and Adele at couples therapy, and this is the first we see of the therapist, Madeline. Adele admits to having fantasized about Caden dying so she can start again guilt-free. Caden, does that feel terrible? Yeah. Okay, good. Now we're back outside the theater, and if you look closely, you can see Sammy's jacket. Once Hazel sits down with Caden, Sammy's appearance becomes a little more obvious. So I, I'm reading the trial. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'd imagine that if I were familiar with the novel she's referencing, I'd probably find some similar themes to this film. But even despite that, it's interesting to note that this novel wasn't published until after the author had died. It's also important to note that the last time we saw Hazel, she was just barely starting Swan's Way. When watching this film, it seems as though not that much time has passed at all. But just like the beginning of the film, there is evidence suggesting that time is moving much faster than we think. We now get to see their relationship playfully grow and develop. Hazel verbally guides him into saying things she wants to hear from him, and Caden seems to enjoy it. Then, you say, in fact, Hazel, you're very bright, and I love your eyes. In fact, Hazel, you're very bright. Oh, am I? <laughs> and I love your eyes. Do you? <laughs> Back at home, the plumber is fixing their sink, and Caden has to urinate. Can you, do you, can you step out for a second? Go ahead. I've seen boy parts. He goes down to the basement where Adele is painting and asks if he can piss in her sink. When he does, it looks a little disturbing. And oddly enough, the color of his urine is never mentioned again throughout the entire film. So I guess the real question is, does Caden even notice? It's possible that this is just another way to emphasize his health issues, but it's also possible that it was making a statement with how obsessive he was over nothing, and how oblivious he is when something actually looks wrong. After he's done, we get another helpful glimpse into their characters. We have, uh... 560 lighting cues. I don't know why I make it so complicated. That's what you do. Again, this emphasizes what I mentioned earlier with Adele and Caden being complete opposites. It's no coincidence that he's talking about how complex his theater piece is, while simultaneously Adele is working on her small paintings. I can't come tonight, I'm sorry. 
I have two canvases I have to get ready to ship for tomorrow. I just, I know it's, it's opening nice. night. I know. I wish I could come. I would if I could. I'm gonna get ready. Like I, I, have like to, I have to get ready. I don't know what I'm gonna wear. I'll have to figure out what I'm gonna wear. Later at the show, we see Hazel is there. After the show, it becomes increasingly obvious just how much Hazel cares for Caden. They sit down and chat, and Caden mentions the future trip to Berlin. Uh, her show in Berlin is in two weeks. We're gonna go there for like a month. Hazel offers to smoke some weed with him in her car. Caden declines the offer, and then we get a brief shot of Hazel driving back later in the night. We cut back and we see Caden poking at something weird in his arm. He looks at the clock and it's already past six in the morning. He comes home to see Maria, who has stayed up all night with Adele getting high. You can see on Caden's face how much it hurts him after Adele said she couldn't make opening night because she was too busy. After watching the movie a few times, you're really able to pick up on the subtleties in the actor's performances. Just pay attention to how much resentment Maria has for Caden, and even more subtle is how held back Adele is in the resentment she's hiding from Caden. I'd love you to, to know what you think. Well, it doesn't matter what I think. Absolutely. It's all about your artistic satisfaction, Caden. Yeah. <laughs> So now is the scene where Hazel buys her house. This is the first scene in the film where its dreamlike presentation becomes really obvious. It's a scary decision. I, I never thought I'd buy a house alone. But you know, I'm 36 and I, I wonder what it is I'm waiting for. Home buying is always scary. <laughs> and with the fire and all, especially. Well, it's a good size though, 2,200 square feet, not including the partially finished basement. Like I mentioned briefly in part one, the idea of this scene is to show that the decisions we make ultimately affect the end of our lives. It's also likely that this is an homage to a quote by the late American playwright Tennessee Williams. We all live in a house on fire. No fire department to call. No way out. Just the upstairs window to look out of while the fire burns the house down with us trapped, locked in it. I like it. I, I do. I'm, I'm just really concerned about dying in the fire. It's a big decision how one prefers to die. Later we see Caden at the play with his parents, Adele and Maria. He gets a standing ovation at the end, but they stay seated. They come out of the play, and even though he has an audience full of people that appreciate his work, it's clear that the people he brought with him don't really understand it. You're restaging someone else's old play. It's just there's nothing personal in it. People are uh, coming out of the theater crying. Great. Be a fucking tool of suburban blue haired regional theater subscribers. No, I did not. But what are you, what are you leaving behind? And you act as if you have forever to figure it out. Now it's the next morning and we see the TV in their kitchen. It briefly shows a jackal next to a rotting carcass waiting for Caden to die. There's a cigarette in his hand and from the smoke of the cigarette we can see the image of a clock. We can also see his stalker Sammy in the background. Caden comes to the kitchen and we can see his morning routine hasn't changed at all. I think it might have arthritis. <laughs> Friends on fire. Back on the TV, we can see Caden being carried off to the corral. Now, if you own this on Blu-ray, they actually show these cartoons in the special features. When you are dead, there's no time. The world is a timeless rock. From that, we can see that past the corral sign is one that says stockyards, and this is where livestock is usually kept before slaughter. Even further into the cartoon, we can see a graveyard in the background. So Caden sniffs his milk again and sits down with his newspaper, going straight to the obituaries. We can also see that it's May 25th. Caden, I think I want to go to Berlin with just Olive. I think it would be good for us. Oh, Christ. Good morning, kiddos. Why, why don't you want me to go? You know, I just think it would be a good thing for the two of us to do alone. How do you think I'm supposed to respond to something like that? Listening to the phone call, we can infer that Maria had coerced her into making this decision. Nice. I'm going to. No, I know exactly. Okay, no. I will. I'll call you later. I know, you're right. Bye. So now Caden's walking with Olive and we see yet another random health issue. What's wrong with your face, Daddy? Uh, it's pustules. He tries to explain what they are, but yet again he is misunderstood. I don't know what that means. At the end of the scene, you can see his stalker Sammy in the background yet again. Now Adele's packing for her trip to Germany. Everyone is disappointing at 
the more you know someone. Now what she just said has plenty of relevance to the themes of the film, but it's especially relevant to the lyrics of a song from the film's soundtrack. The soundtrack to the film was composed by the talented John Bryan who also worked on the soundtrack for Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. But this time Charlie Kaufman decided to go the extra mile and influence the soundtrack by writing lyrics for the songs. Not only are these songs fantastic, but it's the perfect example of just how much control Charlie Kaufman had over each aspect in this film. Hearing Adele say everyone is disappointing the more you know someone brings a lot of weight already, but the lyrics in the film's soundtrack do a great job at explaining just exactly what this idea means. No. What Charlie Kaufman is getting at is our universal desire to be loved, and when we wind up pursuing those desires, we wind up creating dishonest versions of ourselves to sell to other people. In attempts to win affection from someone, we wind up only showing the parts of ourselves that we think that other person would like. Even if two people are incompatible as a whole, we often wind up showing the smaller parts of ourselves that are compatible in an attempt to make things work. The desire to be loved by someone is so strong that people often wind up convincing themselves into being with the wrong person. And when that person initially only shows the parts of themselves that they think you would like, it's easy to make that mistake. What Charlie Kaufman is doing is lamenting over how people are most compatible the less that they know about each other. And this is something that everyone experiences, whether it be romantically or otherwise. At the end of the scene, we see Adele try to comfort Caden with words that she doesn't even believe herself. I love you. Now that Adele's gone, we see Caden spending time in her art studio to try and feel closer to her. We then see him watching an ad on TV for a chemotherapy drug. Once again, he eerily shows up on the screen. Soon after, he starts paying attention to an abnormality on his leg. He then starts obsessively cleaning the basement while the TV shows foreboding imagery corresponding with the end of the film. Time quickly passes and the basement becomes virtually spotless. It's important to note that as soon as he finishes, he starts paying attention to his leg again. What he was doing was using cleaning as a a way to occupy himself and keep his mind off of his own health issues. When left alone with nothing but his own thoughts, he became consumed by his constant over-worrying about death. Eventually he had had enough and decided he needed to force his mind into being occupied with something else. Just think about what's being shown on the TV. As soon as he starts cleaning, we can see our main character near the end of his life. But what's more important is the fog. When Caden starts cleaning, he is more or less fogging up his constant thoughts about death. By keeping himself occupied, he is able to free himself from those constant worries. In the short montage of him cleaning, we can hear that the television has turned back into somewhat normal programming. And as soon as there's nothing left to clean, we can see that the TV is yet again displaying his own insecurities. Now that he's no longer occupied, his thoughts have returned back to death. When the montage begins and we start to hear seemingly normal programming from the television, this is the first thing we hear. I'm on the first train out of Pinocchio. This is to emphasize that he's found a way out of his worrisome thoughts. In the second shot of the montage, we're told about a miracle brush. The miracle brush? You can scour everything? This is to emphasize that Caden's cleaning is his salvation. Later in the film, when Caden first starts to clean Adele's apartment, right outside we can see the word angelic. In the third and fourth shots, the dialogue is incredibly optimistic. Rise and shine! Wow. Lift those legs! This is to emphasize the overall effect that cleaning has had on Caden. And in the very next shot, now that everything is clean, the TV has gone back to being the eerie, invisible virus of thought it was before. There's no real way of coming when your parachute won't open. You're falling down, you're going down. You fell, then you died. Maybe someone cried, but not your one time pride. Now Caden goes back to therapy, and the very first thing we hear him say is, I'm lonely. He explains that he's afraid of death and wants to do something important while he's here. Meanwhile, we see the therapist has blisters on her feet from her shoes being too tight. This is something that we see several times throughout the film when Caden visits the therapist. I think what Charlie Kaufman is trying to say by showing this is that behind every common professional complexion is a person with their own problems. Soon she sells Caden one of her books called Getting Better, and directly after we see Caden on her website. 
Now since the television has more or less been a window into Caden's thoughts, it's reasonable to assume that what he sees here is also reflective of what he's thinking. The reason why he's at therapy in the first place is because he's lonely and afraid of death. He's there in the hopes that he can find out a way to make a change in his life, much like they were hoping that therapy would save their marriage, and much like Adele was hoping that having a child would change things. Caden is hoping to receive some magical wisdom from someone who appears to be entirely confident and successful, but as we can see, she is also a flawed human being with her own problems just like everyone else. Now we see Caden at the dentist. Five. Oh, I'm five, so that's not good. Keep it the flossing. We'll see in three months. Six. 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 I'm gonna recommend you see a periodontist. From this scene, we can tell that months have been passing while Adele's been away. But if you remember earlier, the trip was initially supposed to be for only a month. Uh, her show in Berlin is in two weeks. We're gonna go there for like a month. It's also possible that hearing 666 in this scene is another way to fuel into the movie's theme of death. So now Caden makes a phone call to Adele saying he can't wait to see them on the 12th. When Adele answers, she mistakes him as Ellen. Hello, who is this? Caden. Ellen? She hangs up on him and Caden suffers some sort of an attack. He calls 911 and then the operator misidentifies his gender. 911, state your emergency. I'm sick! Ma'am? I'm sick! These subtle details in this scene are seeds being planted for something that's to come later in the film. Are you Ellen? Ellen? What? Are you Ellen Bascom? What? I'm to give the key to 31Y to Ellen Bascom. Yes, I'm not one. Now Caden's waiting to see a doctor and he sees Adele in a magazine. Again, to emphasize how her small paintings are reflective of her overall character, we see a quote from her saying, When I look, I see. When I see, I paint. It's that simple. He gets called in to see a doctor and everything feels oddly dystopian. Autonomic functions are going haywire. You'll lose your ability to salivate, cry, etc. And serious? We don't know, but yes. We'll get you enrolled in some biofeedback program. Maybe you can learn some sort of manual override. So now Caden goes up to Hazel, and Hazel suggests they get a drink together. For a brief amount of time, we can see a dog in the background. This dog is actually the remnants of an earlier draft of the script. Supposedly, there was supposed to be a scene where Hazel finds the dog on the side of the road. Now they're out getting drinks, and Hazel asks if he wants to come over to her place. Adele is only on vacation. She hasn't called since she left. It's been a year. It's been a week. Now the song playing in the background is another one that Charlie Kaufman wrote the lyrics to. As expected, the lyrics play into the themes of the film very closely. Part of the song plays into the idea of insignificance, and that becomes more relevant as the film goes on. But the song also talks about a longing for a connection with a special someone, so it's entirely appropriate that it would be playing over this sequence. I'm Some fun. Did you put something out? If that's what it takes, consider it done. Poof. Love potion number 69. So now we're at Hazel's house, and once again, she guides him into saying what she wants to hear from him. I want you to beg me on your knees for a kiss. Just for fun. Instead of asking for a kiss, he says something a little more revealing about why he's there. Will you help me forget my troubles? Kiddo. You don't even know. They start to get romantic, but Caden breaks down, overcome with his own problems. I think I'm dying. Jesus. I have a kid, and I'm married. Back at home, the issue with his leg is getting worse. He calls Hazel, but it looks like she's been affected enough by the incident not to pick up. At this point in the film, Caden receives a letter that he's been named a 2009 MacArthur Fellow. Remember that Adele's show in Berlin was in 2006. It is our hope that you will use your newly found financial freedom to create something unflinchingly true, profoundly beautiful, and of unremitting value to your community and to the world at large. So I got this MacArthur okay. grant. Yeah. A lot of money. You know what you're gonna do with it? The theater piece. You know, something big and true and tough. I finally put my real self into something. 
What is your real self, do you think? Now what she just said is very important, not just because she's a character where we've only seen her professional exterior, I mean, what is her real self, but also because it highlights what Caden goes through by the end of the film. In his quest for truth and honesty, it does wind up becoming quite the search for his true self. I guess you'll have to discover your real self. Right? Yeah. One of the more interesting traits that we see in the relationship between Caden and Madeline is that she often winds up starting her sentences before his are already finished. I wanted to ask you, how old are kids when they start Listen, to write? This is an absolutely brilliant novel written by a four-year-old. Really? Little Winky by Horace Aspiazu. It's interesting to note that the cover of her book that we see is It's Raining Too Loud, Surviving an Emotional Downpour. And unlike other scenes in this exact location, this is one where you can see and hear that it's raining outside. She explains Little Winky as a graphic story with mature themes. Wow. R written by a four-year-old. Well, that's because he killed himself when he was five. Why did he kill himself? I don't know. Why did you? What? I said, why would you? Oh, I don't know. Now, it's my understanding that some people watching this film take away that Caden's in purgatory. He does try to commit suicide once in the film, so one interpretation is that he was successful and that this is all taking place afterwards. You fell, then you died. Now, I don't personally buy into that theory completely, but it is an interesting way to look at the film. Because of the dreamlike state that this film is going for, I don't think that it necessarily has to be that way. Later in the film, Caden is described as a man already dead, but it's entirely possible that he's dead and alive at the same time. The rules in this universe are pretty flexible, and not everything is literal. So I accept the purgatory theory as a possibility, but it's not one that has to be true for the film to make sense. Caden Guitard was a man already dead. He, um, he lives in a half world between stasis and anti-stasis, and time is concentrated, chronology confused. Now Caden's choosing out the location for his ambitious theatrical project, and the physics of this seem near impossible. So now Caden's with Hazel asking her to work with him on his new project. He forces himself to salivate for his biofeedback training. Back at home, Caden breaks open the diary and reads that Olive's favorite color is pink. Caden decides to get a pink gift and send it to Germany. So it's at this point in the film where Caden really delves into what he wants his theatrical piece to be. And if you've seen the film, you'll know that it transforms into something super complicated. So as not to have the topic in each of these videos be too scattered, I'm gonna end part two right away. Everyone try to be patient while I work on the rest of these because I'm trying to work on a few things at once. I'm trying to have a healthy variety on this channel and I am just one little person. So stay tuned for more analyzing of intellectual movies, but also stay tuned for more hilarious bashing of stupid pieces of shit. Regardless of which type of video you're waiting for, I appreciate your patience. And if we've learned anything from this movie, the time will have passed before before we know it.